like a lot of Americans last year, I woke up to climate change. I woke up to the immediacy of it. I woke up to the power of it. And I woke up to the fact that there's more going on than our scientists, even five years ago, had predicted. Now, because I'm a science writer, I have an innate curiosity about the science. And certainly in 2013, a number of new scientific reports came out that were absolutely stunning and really do need to be translated for the public. Fortunately, I discovered videos of three of the major scientists in this effort in climate change, and their videos are tremendous teaching tools. I'm going to excerpt in this particular video uh, three of these scientists, they all happen to be women, and I'll be excerpting them and embedding my own understanding to give you a sense of how their particular research fits into the bigger picture of climate change. So let's get started. The first video excerpts we'll be watching will be of Professor Jennifer Francis of Rutgers University in New Jersey. She's a climatologist who specializes both in the Arctic and also in understanding how changes in the Arctic polar ice are already affecting the jet stream. Now the first seven minutes will be an excerpt of Jennifer introducing to a conference of weather forecasters in January of this year of what happened in 2012, the main events, the things that really started to pique our interest that something is happening right now as a result of the carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere. Jennifer Francis was invited to keynote the conference because of a paper that she published in March 2012 on the jet stream and its connection to global warming and loss of Arctic sea ice. She was lead author of that paper titled Evidence Linking Arctic Amplification to Extreme Weather in Mid-Latitudes. Let's hear what she has to say. It hasn't been that long that we've actually talked about weather and climate in the same conversation. Scientists are just, out, just now starting to make these connections between what's happening in the climate system and how it's affecting our weather patterns. I think we can all agree that Mother Nature in the last several years has dished up an incredible smorgasbord of extreme weather. And we've seen just all sorts of, of types of extreme weather um, coming up. And so what I want to do today is bring you up to date on some recent research that's connecting climate change with extreme weather events and uh, tell you the bottom line first, and that is the evidence is really starting to pile up. So I don't know about you, but I've been noticing a real change in the conversation that I've been hearing in the public, in uh, interviews with media, with journalists, um, on TV. People are really starting to notice that extreme weather is increasing. It's affecting everybody personally, not just here in the United States. And they're starting to ask questions. What the heck is going on? Is this climate change? Some of the things we've heard uh, just in the last year, very frequently, the word unprecedented. We seem to be hearing that word all the time in connection with weather. Global weirding, that was a new one that came up this year. Weather madness, hell and high waters, we know we, what comes to mind with that one, and a new state. Here's some examples of that. 2012, we just found out, was the warmest and second most extreme year in U.S. history. This past March was the warmest March in U.S. history. This past whole spring, the most extreme season in U.S. history. This past June broke or tied 3,215 high temperature records in the U.S. alone. July 2012, this past July, was the hottest month in U.S. history. September 2012, Earth's warmest September on record for the whole Earth. November 2012, Earth's 333rd consecutive warmer than average month. And then last spring in 2011 was the most extreme on record for precipitation in the U.S. and clearly we just saw 2010 was really bad too. July 2011 was the most extreme July on record for the U.S. I mean, the list is just mind-boggling. 
And then finally, 10 of the 11 warmest years on record worldwide observed since 1998. So what the heck is going on here? And really, the question is becoming, is human-caused climate change playing a role? And I think for many years, up until very recently, scientists were very uh, hesitant to weigh in on this topic. But more and more, we're hearing that it's not something that people are shying away from anymore. And I'm one of those. And I think climate change is playing a very huge role. And that's what I want to talk about today. The last time the Arctic was as warm as it is now, which was about 125,000 years ago, the sea level was six to eight meters higher. And this goes back to what I said earlier about how the Earth hasn't caught up yet with the carbon dioxide levels that, we're, that we have in the atmosphere right now. This is really bad news. And speaking of bad news, 2012 was just a horrible year for the Arctic. Here's one example. This is the amount of snow cover during the spring over the whole northern hemisphere land areas and how it's changed over time starting around the mid-1960s. So this is the snow, the amount of snow cover in terms of anomalies um, going back to the 1960s up to present. And what you can see is that starting around uh, the about 1990 or so, these anomalies in the snow cover just started to go through the basement. And in fact, this past summer, we just totally obliterated the record in both June and July for the minimum amount of snow on high latitude land. Greenland is another big story this summer. For the first time in at least 150 years, the entire surface of Greenland melted for a few days, about 98% of the surface. And then, of course, the sea ice was also a huge story this year. And now, I would call it a mere shadow of its former self. Its former self looks like this. Looking down uh, with a satellite on the North Pole, you can see Greenland there. This pink stuff is all of the sea ice that it used to look like this back in only 1980 at the end of the summer. So this is the time when the ice is at its minimum extent. But this summer, it looked like this. And you can see that it's much, much smaller than it was only since 1980. And in fact, the amount of ice has decreased in area by about half in only 30 years. So then if you take into account the thickness of the ice and you multiply the thickness times the area, you get the volume. The volume is now 80% less than it was only 30 years ago. And what's left now in the summer, you can see the colors look a little different from what they used to look like back in 1980. That means that the ice that's left is very broken, it's very thin, it's rotten, it's <coughs> slushy, and that means that any anomalies in the winds or heating events or whatever that come along can easily melt that ice. It's a very vulnerable ice cover now. The next video clip of Jennifer Francis presenting to the weather forecasters in January will be about her specialty, the jet stream. And very little of the technical information I'm going to include here. Rather, I suggest if you want more, you go to the YouTube excerpt shown here. Now, the important thing to take away from her message is that the jet stream serves as a kind of barrier keeping the cold air of the Arctic north and the warm air of the temperate zones south. She talks about how the loss of sea ice and the exposure of actual sea surface to the atmosphere up in the Arctic is causing a weakening of the jet stream. It's just not as strong as it used to be. So when you have a weakening of the jet stream, it means that you lose strength and when the jet stream loses strength, it has a tendency to meander more, kind of like a river that loses strength coming out of the mountains and out on the flat starts to meander around. It loses speed, it loses strength. So when the jet stream loses strength, begins to meander, 
Those meanders mean that it causes more extreme weather. The cold in the north can reach down further in what look like troughs, and the heat and dry coming up from the south reaches further into the north. Just as important as the weakening of the jet stream that causes this deeper meander is the fact that once it starts producing these troughs and ridges, they tend not to go away. So instead of a cold event or a dry event coming in and passing through in a day or two, it can stay there. It can stay there for a week. It can stay there for longer. And that's what we've been seeing. So here's Jennifer Francis explaining the jet stream. This is a little an animation of the actual jet stream. This is created with real data by NASA's uh, Science Visual Visualization Laboratory. And what you're seeing here are little vectors showing what the winds are doing at something like five or 500 millibars or so. The colors indicate the wind speed, so the red colors here um, are where the winds are faster. Right now we're looking down on the northern hemisphere, uh, down on the uh, North Pole, and what you can see is a typical sort of jet stream encircling the entire northern hemisphere. So as I put this in motion, what you're going to see is these waves in the jet stream that we're all familiar with. And there are times when these waves are relatively low amplitude. And we know that in this kind of a condition, the storms tend to ride pretty quickly across the northern hemisphere. So when I start this up again, what you're going to see is the character of this wave change over time. And it's going to go into this configuration now of being much higher amplitude. And as you'll notice, as I set it in motion again, these waves, these big large scale waves in the jet stream are not going to move very fast across the northern hemisphere. They tend to be kind of stuck. We tend to see cutoff lows. We tend to see blocking highs. And this is, and we tend to see a lot of messy stuff going on too. The jet stream is not a simple um, creature. So finally, what I thought I'd do is take some specific extreme weather events um, that were that are chosen particularly because they're the kind of events that are related to very persistent weather conditions and see what the jet stream looked like when they happened. So let's take for example the record snows in Alaska last year and see what the jet stream looked like um, during that time period. There's this really cool website uh, that the San Francisco State University puts out where you can look at the jet stream pattern pretty much any day going back um, a long time. And you can do animations too. But this is showing what the jet stream uh, pattern looked like during the time period when most of this snow fell um, back in January last year. And you can see here's Alaska up here, there's the coast of California. And you can see that the jet stream was in this highly amplified flow, a big trough in the Gulf of Alaska, bringing all this moisture right up into southeast Alaska where the snows were so heavy. And probably Matt is thinking, oh yeah, I remember when it was really dry in Oregon then too, because when you get a big trough, you usually have a big ridge right next to it. And uh, so again, a very amplified flow uh, during this extreme event. Last summer, or last September actually, this, just a few months ago, um, they had unprecedented flooding in Spain. And the jet stream pattern then, again, we're talking about a very highly amplified flow. Here's Spain right here, there's Greenland up there, so here's uh, the northeast of North America. Again, a big ridge in the North Atlantic, big trough dipping down just west of Spain, bringing all this moisture right into Spain. And that was parked there for a good week. So here's the March heat wave that we had um, just this past March with you know, record-breaking temperatures over much of the east and the jet stream pattern associated that with that. Once again, big trough over the west with persistent low pressure, big ridge over the east, persistent high pressure, persistent being that key word. Since the conference was held in January 2013, of course, Professor Francis knew she had to speak about the jet stream and Hurricane Sandy. And the $64 billion question that I've been asked, I don't know how many times, and whether Sandy was somehow connected to climate change and sea ice loss because they happened so near each other in time. So I'm sure you've all seen a graphic like this one 
um, where it shows the big trough that was in place over uh, the Mississippi Valley with the big um, blocking high stretching way up over Greenland. And of course, we know this big blocking high not only helped steer Sandy, Sandy into the East Coast, but it also set up this huge area of very strong pressure gradient between Sandy and this big high, which created the large area all along the East Coast with those strong east winds just pounding the East Coast and bringing that huge storm surge in. So this very unusual situation that Sandy ran into as it came up from the south. So as the ocean warms, the hurricane seasons may lengthen. So we might see more storms like Sandy forming later in the season. And the warming oceans may also allow these storms to move farther northward and track farther northward before they're weakened by the cold water, which is exactly what we saw was the case with Sandy. And perhaps, as John suggested, they're going to have more opportunities to interact with these very amplified flows that we expect to occur more often in the future. Maybe. Ever since Professor Francis taught me about the jet stream, I've had a very different relationship to extremes of weather. I often go on to the same website that she talked about there in which she showed the jet stream configuration for various times in gray and white. All you need to do is Google jet stream animation and that'll take you there and it's pretty self-explanatory. Here I'd like to show you an example of a jet stream animation that I captured in January, right around the time of this conference. Because in Colorado, where my husband and I were staying at the time, the temperature actually got down to lower than minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit for more than five days in a row and this was a record temperature. Now, if you don't understand the jet stream, uh, you might think that, well, there you go, global warming is a myth. Well, once you understand the effect of polar ice and the weakening of the jet stream, and you see these deep amplitude changes that go on, you have a whole new understanding. So let's take a look at what happened over a course of five days in Colorado you'll see where we were staying in the San Luis Valley at the red star there shown. And watch the jet stream move over a course of four or five days in mid-January. Watch how it stays in one spot, how that deep, deep trough allows very cold polar air to come in. And you may remember during that time in mid-January, Los Angeles experienced snow uh, just a short way north of it and in fact, the great lettuce crops down in Yuma, Arizona uh, had devastating frosts that then rose the price of lettuce all over the USA. So yes, loss of Arctic sea ice weakens the jet stream, allowing more meanders. And that brings not only extreme heat and dry, it brings extreme cold. The next scientist we're going to see in video excerpts is Professor Julie Brigham Gret at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's a geologist, and here you're going to learn about a massive project that she's been involved in for many years. This one takes place in Siberia, and it's quite an expedition. Here you'll see excerpts from a longer program that you can find at this URL. Now let's watch the excerpts. So I'd like to talk to you about um, uh, what's kind of you know, driven me crazy, but with uh, a lot of joy over the last uh, literally 15 to 17 years. Uh, this is a project that I started. I date it by the fact that my younger son was two years old when I started this project, and he's 19 years old now. So just a little bit of a word of, of explanation for, or at least uh, encouragement to you graduate students, if you've got a really good idea, don't give up. In my work with, with um, Russian colleagues starting in 1990, I learned about this amazing lake basin, Olga Glushkova from Magadan uh, uh, Nezri Institute, showed me a picture of El Gigikin, uh one afternoon in 1994. And she said, Julie, we should core this lake. <laughs> and I said, sure, let me find some money um, to do it. 
And the more I learned about this lake, the more fascinated I became, became by it. It was formed in the middle Pliocene, for those of you not uh, uh, familiar with geologic time periods. If we go back about 3.6 million years ago, the Arctic was very warm. Uh, in fact, the Antarctic was kind of warm too. But it, the, the world was relatively warm, and the Arctic was forested. We didn't have a Greenland ice sheet like we have today, but we had forests, even as high as up to the northern coast of Ellesmere Island, we had five different kinds of pine right up to the Arctic coast. We didn't have sea ice at that time. And our best estimates for um, the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at this time is not well known. But the best estimates by Mark Pagani and others are that we were at about 400 parts per mil, or very similar to where we are today. So looking back as far back as 3.6 million years ago could perhaps inform us of, of some of the changes that may be in store as we continue to warm, uh, to warm the Earth. So this uh, artistic rendition of what the landscape may have been like is not too far uh, uh, from what we imagine. So Lake El Gigikin, um, what is positioned here on the, on the uh, crest of the Anadir Mountains in northeast Chukotka. It occurs in an area right smack dab in the middle of an area that was, that was not glaciated ever. So it never had large continental ice sheets there. Areas to the west and to the, and to the east did, did receive glaciation and, and were glaciated. And there's good um, uh, geomorphology to, to show that. Um, but this area was never glaciated. So we had potentially this, this beautiful bowl that's been in place for 3.6 million years, accumulating sediments and organic matter and fossils of various kinds to tell us about the regional climate of the Arctic all in one place. It was a dream come true. I could take all of these places that I'd studied across the Arctic and collate them into one record in one place. So then we had to get the drill rig, of course, across the Atlantic through Bering Straits and up into Pivik here. We actually had 15 containers that came across the Pacific, and, and then two more from, uh, from Germany that came across the Trans-Siberian Railroad. They met, and one week later, this stuff went up through the Bering Straits on the last ship going up to the north. So we were able to get that stuff in there. And then the last legs were taken by truck. And I just want to show you that it really is rather roadless. We, here's Pivik, and we had to get the 300 kilometers to the lake, which is here. So our trucks came across to this, across to here, and then they were pulled, literally by bulldozer, through the snow, the last 90 kilometers. 90 kilometers. So we had the camp over here on the edge of the lake, and then we had a road, seven kilometers, that came out to the drill site, and we distributed the weight of the drill pipe and so on around the pad. OK, so why do we want to do this? What is it about this lake that's so important? Well, one thing is we don't really understand what the climate history of the Arctic really is over time. There's, we, we have pieces of information we really don't know. And, and so we have a record like this. For those of you who are familiar with this, you'll recognize this is a composite record from the oceans. If you could take the climate record of the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, the Atlantic, put it into one diagram, climate history that goes back to 5 million years here up to the present here. And these wiggles here tell you something relative about temperature. Just think that up is warm and down is cold. That's all the information you need. So we can see that over from the last 5 million years, we go through these warm and cold, warm and cold. And we see that they change in amplitude, and they get um, more wild over the last uh, more recent time. This is a composite from the ocean. But would the Arctic look the same? Is the history of the Arctic the same? How did the changes in the Arctic correspond to some of these changes? What do these sediments look like? They're beautiful. Um, maybe I'm just a nerdy geologist, but um, these are gorgeous. And they were beautifully collected by uh, the Dosik Drilling Company. Um, and we, we can identify these, these five or six different uh, facies here from things that are very well <laughs> laminated to things that just have changes in color. This is a pollen record. So this goes from. Um, from 3.6 million to 2.6 million years. The biggest change in here is that right at about 2.7 million years ago, we see a major change 
from forest to mainly tundra. You know, if you just, if, like I take the glasses off, and the fuzzy story here is mainly forest, mainly tundra, with a big change happening at 2.7 uh, million years ago. Now, on May 9th, 2013, this year, just a week or so ago, their paper was published. Julie was one of 16 co-authors. She was the lead author on this paper that 3.2 to 3.6 million years ago, the land area of the Arctic was much, much warmer than we had previously thought. Now, this paper was published in the top scientific journal, Science Magazine, and it caused a splash not just in the scientific community, but also in the media, because May 9th was one day after the May 8th reading in Hawaii of 400 parts per million carbon dioxide for the very first time. Now, because scientists regard civilization over thousands of years of having relatively stable carbon dioxide levels, about 280 parts per million, which is what my great-grandparents experienced when they were born, and now it's going up so quickly, people have wondered what is it going to be like when the melting of the sea ice, when the melting of the glaciers, when the absorption of heat into the oceans finally catches up with the amount of carbon dioxide in there now. What's the temperatures going to be like? What's the climate and weather going to be like at 400 parts per million or more? That's what Professor Brigham Grant and her colleagues are helping us understand. So sediment cores from the Siberian lake have proved to be a treasure trove for our climate understanding. Important as well is a fossil discovery that another scientist made in the Arctic and which was reported on this year too. It's about camels in the Arctic. Camels who lived around the same time as Julia Brigham Gratt's climate work explored. That is the Pliocene. Lead author of this new report about camels in the Arctic is Natalia Ripchinsky. She's a paleobiologist at the Canadian Museum of Nature, and that's at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Her specialty is wildlife of the Arctic in the past, and that, of course, can help us get a handle on what the climate conditions were like in the Pleistocene and especially the Pliocene, which we're now learning our carbon dioxide right now puts us in the same carbon regime. My name is Natalia Rybczynski. I'm a paleobiologist at the Canadian Museum of Nature. What we discovered was the first evidence of a camel in Canada's high Arctic. So today, camels are associated with arid environments, especially hot environments. Um, people are really surprised to find out that, in fact, camels originated about 45 million years ago in North America. They would have arrived in Eurasia via Bering Land Bridge, which would have connected Alaska and Russia. The camel remains were discovered on west central Ellesmere Island in the Strathcona Fjord area. Now there's two fossil sites that we're working on there. One is called the Beaver Pond site, and then about 10 kilometers away, there's the Filed Leaf Bed site. And that's where the camel was discovered. And in fact, it took three field seasons to recover all of the bones uh, that we currently have. These are just fragments, and they all put together make up um, part of the limb bone of a camel. We have a couple of lines of evidence that indicate this is a camel. First, there's collagen fingerprinting. This is work done by Mike Buckley at the University of Manchester. Using collagen fingerprinting, he could identify from the fragmentary remains that this animal was a camel. At the same time, we were putting together the fragments that we collected in the field. And these came out together to show that this was a large cloven hoofed animal, and this is consistent with camels from that time. In the field, these fossil fragments really look just like shards. Um, they could even be just fossil wood. They look a lot, in fact, like the Eocene wood that we're also finding in the Strathcona Fjord area. So in fact, the first time I found and picked up a piece, um, it wasn't certain until I got back to the camp that it was actually bone. Strathcona Fjord has a really remarkable fossil record of Pliocene age, so about three and a half million years ago. Um, we have evidence of this time in the form of fossilized trees, so there's a lot of fossilized wood. There's animals like a bear, a deerlet, we have beaver as well, and of course now we have evidence of a camel. There are several traits seen in modern camels that could have been very helpful for the high arctic camel. 
For example, the wide flat feet that are useful for walking on sand could also have been useful for walking on snow. In addition, the hump serves as fat storage. So this could have been essential for an animal that would have to survive a long, dark, cold winter. In addition, camels have very large eyes that could also be suitable for seeing in low light regime that would have characterized the winter in the boreal forest. Working with John Goss at Dalhousie University, we were able to establish the first direct date of this site, roughly 3.5 million years old. So this is a very important time in the history of the planet because at this time, the planet was about two to three degrees warmer than it is today. Yet our climate research shows that in the Arctic, the temperatures were 14 to 22 degrees warmer. So what this find really highlights is that the high Arctic is a frontier for paleobiology. We are always finding new taxa, new um, specimens that reveal important information about the history of biodiversity on the planet and also the history of climate change. In 2013, Natalia Rybczynski was lead author of this paper. Finally, I'm going to splice in a five-minute excerpt of a panel discussion that took place at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City in 2013. Lisa Gromlich, the woman in green pictured here, is a paleoecologist now at the University of Washington. There, she is Dean of the new College of the Environment. I'll explain at the end why her words are particularly meaningful for me. This clip begins with the voice of Tom Brokaw, who's the moderator here, and he's inviting Professor Gromlick to speak. And Dean Lisa, uh, in your work at the University of Washington in environmental studies, for a lot of people in this country that I talk to, they say, I don't see climate change. I, I, it yeah. doesn't seem warmer to me, or I don't see the changes that they're talking about in cataclysmic terms. When you get to the West, is it a more graphic change? Tom, it's absolutely more graphic. And as a paleoclimatologist, I study long-term patterns of climate change and develop the kind of data where we can say with great confidence that the world has warmed two degrees Fahrenheit over the last hundred years, and people kind of glaze over. And then you say, well, and the West has warmed four degrees Fahrenheit over the last hundred years, and people kind of twitter their thumbs. And that doesn't mean anything when it's just a number degrees Fahrenheit. So I want to tell you a little bit about what that means to the physical and biological systems. Let's take Glacier National Park in your favorite state, where we know that when we first explored Glacier National Park, there were about 150 glaciers. When the park was established in 1910, there were 150 glaciers. Today, there are 25. We've lost 125 glaciers from Glacier National Park. And my science colleague, Dan Fagri at the park, who tracks all of this and is looking closely at it, previously was predicting that all of the glaciers would be gone by 2030, although there's ways that these processes accelerate. There's a lot of positive feedbacks, and he, he believes we might actually lose them before then. Now, it's not just snow in glaciers that we're losing. We're actually losing the snowpack, the year-to-year -year snowpack extent, depth, um, throughout the West. So right around the end of World War II, we started to actually measure snowpack seriously, in part because of its implications for water resources. We've got great data, thousands and thousands of observations. And we know that we, in a typical year now, we have 30% less snow than we did over the 20th century. The last couple of decades, we've seen that. Snow moves off the landscape two to four weeks before it used to. And 
It turns out the research that I do with my students has also shown that in the past, these droughts would kind of move from the northern Rockies to the southern Rockies and then back again. But since 1980, we have seen this pattern from the Canadian border to the Mexican border. The snowpack has all disappeared. So when you lose snow two to four weeks early and you have less snow, it's not just bad skiing. Everything biologically speeds up. Spruce budworm, any of the, the number of insect pests to western forests start to reproduce more quickly. And so those of you that have driven through the west see there's vast areas where trees are, are dying. Leaf litter, the pine needles that sort of exist between pine trees, dry out faster. So once you get an ignition, the fires go. We know that two degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperatures will increase forest fire area burned by a factor of four, and we're seeing it. The U.S. Forest Service currently spends half of its budget fighting fire. Now, what that means is if we think about the challenge to Roosevelt's generation, it was identifying land for parks, Yellowstone National Park, bringing in the army to protect it, and leaving it alone. We can't do that today. Parks are now embedded in a much larger landscape that will forever be fundamentally changed, and it creates a new way in which we need to think about stewardship of parks, wilderness, wild lands in a much more connected way than we ever did in Roosevelt's time. I was fortunate that during my college summers I was able to work in national parks, including Yellowstone and Glacier. Now, while in Glacier National Park in 1971, one of the highlights was hiking up Jackson Glacier, which is pictured here. Now, this is a picture taken in 2009, and it's a very different glacier from the glacier I walked up in 1971. The glacier was much more extensive when I was there. In fact, on this particular rock ledge, we were able to walk right on to the white surface of the ice, and from there, hike all the way up on ice not rock, on ice, up to the ridge, and then from there down the other forested side to Lake McDonald Lodge. It's rather unsettling to go back and have a new way of understanding a particular incident in one's life. I had no idea then that I was walking on a dying glacier. Now a second reason why Professor Grumlich's talk is very moving for me is the last two winters my husband and I have spent in Colorado, in the mountains of Colorado, in fact, due west of Colorado Springs, where there was a huge wildfire. Now, both of those winters, I've spent doing a lot of fire mitigation. That is, cutting out the excess number of pines and junipers, and particularly the ones that have already been killed by pine bark beetle. Thinning out the forest so that if a fire does come through, it may not be as devastating. I did all that work with a handsaw, and here you can see me standing on a pile of brush in the burden pit, not far from the Crestone Mountains. Overall, we've come to a time now where understanding climate change is not just learning that there's a greenhouse effect and that increasing carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning is having an effect on the warming of Earth. We could see it happening in the weather around us. We can see it happening in the forest fires of the West, the reduced flow of the western rivers, and the increased fire danger, and certainly for those along the coast, the concerns about storms and storm surge. In my view, understanding the science about how polar ice is affecting the jet stream and that affects the weather, about how the droughts coming to the west is affecting life for everyone who lives in the west, about the increased insurance rates for those of us living in floodplains or along the coast. All of these things and other factors mean that climate change is real. It's happening now, and it's only going to get worse. It's up to those of us alive today to take action right now to ensure that future generations grow up in a livable world 
a beautiful world, a world as wonderful as the one that we were privileged to live in. A final word. So many of us, when we start to experience climate change or we learn the science in a way that it's not just some abstract thing anymore, but we really come to accept that this is happening, we feel overwhelmed. I mean, what can we do? What can anyone do? Well, I'd like to suggest here that there are three things that all of us can do. First of all, we can press for change at a governmental level in a way that will help move the incentives and certainly that means putting a tax or a fee on carbon emissions. We need to put the true cost of altering our climate system onto us, onto these generations, not future generations. And that tax put onto fossil fuels will then release a torrent of business creativity, creativity to bring the renewables on board while encouraging all of us to do the right thing. Two excellent websites in the USA for ending fossil fuel subsidies are Climate Citizens Lobby and 350.org. A second action we can all take at both the individual and institutional level is to shift the very incentives at work within the fossil fuel industries, and that is stock divestment. The action would be that individuals, mutual funds, churches, colleges, and pension funds would examine their investments in stocks and then take the initiative to sell, that is to divest, of any stocks that pertain to industries now profiting from the burning of fossil fuels. The main website for this kind of work is gofossilfree.org. Finally, remember that the personal is political. Share your story, share what you've learned. If the topic of the weather ever comes up with friends, neighbors, coworkers, say, hey, have you learned about the jet stream? And then tell them about it. Refer them to this video and refer them to other websites and resources that you find useful. Here are the resources online that I visit virtually every day. I'd like to close this video with a thanks to our older sisters on the path who changed the cultural climate for women in science.